Welcome, everybody. <clears throat> My name is John Vandermeer. I'm a professor in EEB, and um, I'm here to welcome you all to this symposium to say a few words about its origin and uh, how it's operating and everything like that. Uh, so this is this year's this year's uh, early career scientist symposium of the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. This is an event that occurs every year, and this is our 17th year. It is also, at least for those of us involved in organizing it, a challenging year with a challenging subject. Uh, we're all aware of the transcendent problems of racism in the United States, as well as across the globe, especially in the settler communities emerging from the 16th and 17th century conquest of the European powers. We have seen, for example, the invention of the black race to grease the economic wheels of slavery, then to enforce Jim Crow laws, and finally to justify the mass incarceration we see today. The capture of about half of the country of Mexico brought with it a racial interpretation of those Mexicans who happened to have been living north of the Rio Grande Valley River. And the need for the narrative of empty lands needing colonizers to establish English domination of the settler colonies of the Americas involved the racialization of the original people of the Americas. Add to this the participation of early naturalists in promoting the basic colonial project as they accumulated material for the natural history collections currently held mainly in institutions in the global north. Political movements such as Black Lives Matter have once again brought to our attention these key problems. Universities like the University of Michigan, have responded, but not necessarily in as creative a way as one might expect from institutions that self-characterize themselves as of higher learning. As a positive sign that universities are beginning to take the issue seriously, two years ago, the provost's office of the University of Michigan put out a call for, proposal, for, for proposed new faculty lines, explicitly searching for new and creative research agendas that called for adopting traditional intellectual disciplines to find ways to incorporate anti-racism as a component of their programs. EEB was not able to articulate a potential structure that might answer that call. The general idea was that current research agendas do not comfortably fit into a framework that be, could be viewed as anti-racist. How can the study of ant behavior, to take a random example, how can that be anti-racist? Yet many of us knew of research, perhaps not explicitly announcing itself as anti-racist, <clears throat> but that did in fact incorporate race as a relevant component of its agenda. Richard Lewontin's study of protein polymorphisms, for example, was a direct application of population genetics to the issue of the very definition of race. And to get to the point of today's opening presentation, Stuart Pickard's Pickett, Stuart Pickett's long-term work on applying ecological principles to the racially, racially charged adjudication of resources in the city of Baltimore is another example. Thus, we proposed and managed to get a majority of the EEB community to focus this year's Early Career Scientist Symposium on this topic. As you will see over the course of the four weeks of the symposium, the subject matter is diverse and much to our delight, represents a massive creative effort on the part of all the participants in the symposium. It looks to be an exciting and challenging symposium. Uh, we really need to acknowledge our funders. Uh, as I think it's, well, you've all seen it already, but uh, the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department of LSNA, the Ir Irma M. Wyman grant from the Center for the Continuing Education of Women, and a faculty allies grant from Rackham School of uh, Graduate Studies. Also, a, a little call out here, a shout out for Nancy Wells, who uh, passed uh, nine years ago to this date, actually. Uh, she was the original funder of the Early Career Scientist Symposium, and for I don't know how many years, but several years in a row, she was the main funder of uh, the program. Today's program will include questions from the audience, both present, present and visual, after the presentation. Uh, those of you who are in person, <coughs> please, since this is a hybrid event, before you ask your question, wait for the microphone runner so the millions of people viewing this virtu virtually 
can hear your question. And now to the introduction of today's speaker. Stuart Pickett is well known in several sub-disciplines of ecology, plant ecology, landscape ecology, and urban ecology, amongst others. His academic career began at the University of Illinois, Illinois, as did mine, where he received his PhD. He was at Rutgers from assistant through associate professor and moved to the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies in 1987 as distinguished senior scientist where he is still located today. Stewart is a field ecologist, at least I claim that he's a field ecologist, with field sites in primary forests in western Pennsylvania, post-agricultural fields in New Jersey, riparian woodlands and savannas in Kruger National Park, China's rapidly urbanizing Yanqi Valley, and vacant lots in urban Baltimore. He has a long list of publications, 425 of them according to Google Scholar, including what was for me a super influential book, The Ecology of Natural Disturbance and Patch Dynamics, published in 1985. That book came out at the time I was struggling with these same concepts and trying to understand the natural disturbance of a hurricane in the Nicaraguan rainforest. The book became a very important part of my research agenda. Also worth noting was his 1995 science paper, Landscape Ecology, Spatial Heterogeneity in Ecological Systems, where he first, in my opinion, brought real theoretical ecological dynamics to weigh in on what had been an overly empirical field. His work extended to a focus on urban ecology in 1997 when he founded and was the first director of the Baltimore Ecosystem Study. His long record of ecological research brought him two recent honors. He is the recipient of the Ecological Society of America's 2021 Eminent Ecologist Award, and he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in that same year. Um, quite a year indeed. Without further ado, as they say, I present to you Dr. Stuart T. A. Pickard. I believe the mic is on. Thank you, John, for a very, very kind introduction. Are we on? Yep. Can you hear me? How about now? Thank you. <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm a southerner and I expect feedback <laughs> from the audience. All right, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here and I'm honored to be here. I'm honored for a couple of reasons. One, because of the program that this represents is an incredibly important one for our discipline, and I appreciate that a great deal. The other reason that I'm honored is to kick off the talks today for some amazing, wonderful colleagues whom you'll meet, well, one of whom you know already, but you'll, you'll meet them both uh, specifically when I'm done. <clears throat> All right, okay. I refuse to get involved in technology because that's always a disaster when I try to fix something. That is not mine. That one should be mine. Well, as you can clearly see from the slides. Okay, I, what I wanna to talk to you about today 
is my evolving view of the understanding between race and ecology. And that, as John suggested in his opening, is a complex, changing, and fraught topic. It is not something that the discipline of e ecology has thought about very deeply. And so much of what I may say today is, is, is something that some of you know already, but I think it's important to articulate this for the, to serve the field as a whole. Chapter one, what does race have to do with ecology? All right, clearly. Have to press harder. All right, <clears throat> I'm gonna approach this first through segregation, which is both a pattern and a process. Very much of the empirical literature about segregation rests on pattern. One of the big messages today is that we really need to unpack this into to process. And that pattern and process combination, that, that uh, dialectic, if you will, is familiar to ecology. I'm gonna start out thinking about segregation as pattern based on race, and right away I admit that I'm using the, conven the conventions of the US census, and they are far from, they have problems, and we'll try to clarify that later. So this is a typical dot map. Each dot represents a person in the census. This was um, um, extrapolated to 2016 in the community survey. And you can read this as well as I can, and the colors you can see are distinctly distributed in the city of, of Chicago. I could have pulled out the dot map for almost any city in the United States and had the same story. I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, and yes, that's how you say that. And what we're showing here is the, the degree to which people of each of the census-defined races live with people of that same category. From the top to the bottom in all of the categories, we're moving from prior censuses to current censuses, so there's a little bit of a decrease in segregation in that sense. Louisville is mostly a black-white city, and um, there's a growing Hispanic population, there's a growing Asian population in Louisville. Very, very typical, this is where I grew up. Although I grew up in a funny neighborhood, I grew up in a neighborhood that was highly integrated. I grew up with people from the mountains, I grew up with people, working class black people, I grew up with professional black people, professional people of all, I mean just everybody lived in my neighborhood. I thought that's the way cities were supposed to be, and then urban renewal said no it's not. Um, Here's black-white segregation in the 50 largest, 51 largest metro areas in the United States. Darker colors, more intense segregation by racial categories. Lighter colors, less. Yellow dots around, yellow outlines show areas where segregation is decreasing. This is a, there are many ways to look at segregation. There's no one way that is, is fully accepted necessarily in and of itself. If you look at the average diversity, racial diversity of neighborhoods, that's on the y-axis, compare that to the average diversity of racial, racial diversity of an entire city, what you would expect if, it were, if they were not segregated, you would find things on the one-to-one -one line. Well, where do they fall? They all fall mostly below the one-to-one -one line, except in cities that don't have a large population of racialized people. So this is just very, very common. Baltimore, where I've worked for, for nearly 30 years, is, a, is one of the hyper-segregated cities of the United States. Now, segregation also operates by class, and this is a complex diagram looking at the Twin Cities in, in Minnesota. The y-axis shows you the percent of people of color in a particular census tract. The x-axis shows declining income. And so this shows you the combined effects of racialized category and class. And just, it makes the same point. One of the things that I would advise 
people to do. I don't ha care how convenient it is for R or your statistical programs. Whatever you call it in your programs, in your analysis, keep that to yourself. Please do not use non-white. And I'll let you figure out why. We can talk about that later. Segregation as class, here we're showing this is a global phenomenon, a global phenomenon. And a couple of these pictures I took myself, but many I, I stole from the internet. Very, very common. The, the Valdivia Chile one shows the, the orange spots, especially on your right, show where um, emergency housing was set up after the earthquake. Was that 1960? that just had immense subsidence in Valdivia. And those areas now you see on the, the other side, the other panel of that map to your right, is that that's where social housing has now been permanently constructed, a hazardous place. Segregation as a process. Segregation comes from Latin meaning to separate from the flock. It's something that is done to people based on who's in power and who's is not, who is not. It is a system, and that's what I want to demonstrate, partly what I want to demonstrate. <clears throat> it depends, as I said, on social power. It requires rankings to exist, hence John's comment about race being invented as a tool for, for extraction, a tool for, for capitalism, a tool for colonialism. It didn't exist before that. Difference, yes. Race, no. So we have social origin of these, uh, these ranks, and they are used to justify extraction. I'll say a little bit more about that. This is a diagram. I like to draw pictures of things. And so this suggests that power generates a whole variety of things that, that define status, that define status. Ranking, racialization, or other kinds of othering and the, a reinforcement of this ranking. Race is often given, often taken, as a given, a static, a way that things are. If you look at, at Linnaeus in um, 1735, where he established um, the binomial system, why did they need a binomial system? There was all this stuff coming in from the colonies and they couldn't use the, the Tagalog name or the, the um, old Inca name or something like that. They had to have something that was interpretable and shareable amongst the colonialist venture. And these things were, in, these were invented as natural kinds, to use an old philosophical conundrum. And Linnaeus, in, in, he's the one who said, okay, there are four races, and here are their characteristics. And guess what? Those characteristics and that ranking served the justification of the European colonial process. And, and you can read this. There's a paper by um, Müller Willi, who translates some of Linnaeus's Latin uh, into English, not into German. And it's just remarkable how, you know, it was just, he, he, all right, how to say this? He just made it up. He just made it up. Images, stereotypes, norms, regulations, and laws are all a part of this reinforcement. And erasure is another part of the enforcement, especially, say, with indigenous people, erasure. This was all done to support extraction of wealth, land, and labor. Sometimes the labor was extracted sort of uh, as a remote thing. Sometimes it was extracted by actually stealing the people. Segregation as a sy systemic process. In the last couple of years, a number of media outlets have done similar things. This is a picture from CNN. The National Geographic a couple of years ago had very re readable accounts of how do you look at this, this immense variation and, and generate four races out of this. Now, we're not denying that people have ancestries because we most certainly do. But to, to turn the crank and turn those into four races is, is something that, as many, many um, geneticists and anthropologists have said, just does not make sense. So that's one reason why I will be using the term racialization 
a lot so as not to confuse race as something on the, that we assume is a given and a fixed. All right, so this racialization supports a social system. The system has social functions. And one of the things that we as ecologists seem to be particularly bad at paying attention to is what are the ecological feedbacks that there might be in this system? That's one of the big things that I, as an ecologist, want my discipline to spend, pay more attention to. Now, I'm going to show you something about resilience. I'm going to use the regular old, <laughs> it's actually not that old, but the regular old theory of, of adaptive resilience. And I'm going to show you that the system is adaptive. This is the idealization taken uh, originally proposed by uh, Hollings, translated into social terms by, say, uh, Joseph Tainter in his book, Collapse. And what I'm showing you here is that there are two things. There's capital and connectedness that are liable to change through time in systems. Now I'm talking mainly about social ecological systems. If I weren't talking about social, we could just call this succession. So capital accumulates, connectedness accumulates. Available capital is in the low end here. Of, this is where the, what you might call early succession, alpha or reorganization. This was those, those uh, colonizing species I studied at, at Illinois. Um, and as they interact, there are, inter, there are connections that increase and capital, biological capital, biomass, architectural structure in the system that increases. So this is kind of familiar, but what this is, I'll tell you, this, we're, what we're looking at here is the idealization is that with disturbance, there will be reorganization. If the resources become available and are not lost, then you can have growth based on that. And the, as growth accumulates, the system conserves resources until it's disturbed again. This is a zero force law. This says that with, if you don't have loss of resources after disturbance, and if you don't have legacies in the, in the conservation phase of the system that lock the resources up so that they are not available after disturbance, if you don't have those two things, this will operate essentially as a frictionless system. Now, that's obviously a crazy idealization, but that's what theories are for. And I'm going to show you how this works in Baltimore. This is a map, a plat map of Baltimore. Um, I don't remember exactly the date, but the point that I want you to see here is that you have big streets like Saratoga Street here in Carrollton Avenue. This is in West Baltimore. And then you have little alleys. And I've outlined some of the alley houses to indicate that the alley houses are small, the lots are small, and let me show you how this works. These are some of the houses on the main street. This is cheating a little bit because this one also faces a park. So this is really high class architecture from 1840s Baltimore. What was going on in the alley? So these were the bosses, these were the store owners, the factory owners, the, the ship outfitters. And they had um, servants and slaves that lived nearby. Where did they live? In the alley houses. In the alley houses. One thing that you often hear, there's, there's some terms that you hear in urban ecology and urbanism that are really worse than useless. One of them is blight. Neighborhoods like this are often described as blighted. Now, whose fault is that? This was built blighted. This was built blighted. I'm just saying. So this is Baltimore in maybe the early, 18, the early 1900s, very late 1800s. Kind of a static situation. The wealthy, the white in the main streets, the poor, poor whites and blacks in the alleys. Baltimore, was, Baltimore wasn't very big then. Let's start calling that fine-scale segregation, 1880s through 1910s. I'm going to run you through the adaptive cycle. 
1880s, what was happening in the 1880s? Um, Reconstruction was destroyed in starting around 18, in 1870s, and increasingly, 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 freed black folks were re-oppressed. And a lot of them said, well, I don't know what they said, but what I can interpret them saying, ain't nobody got time for this. And so this m large migration of people from the, the post-slavery South to northern cities. Now, Baltimore doesn't sound very northern to you, but for people in the deep South, it was pretty northern, all right? And so the Great Migration disrupts this fine-scale segregation. There was not enough space in those little alley neighborhoods which, where black people had been um, allowed to live, encouraged to live, because they were near their work. They were near the people they worked for. So what happened? You get people having to spread out through the city, black people having to spread out through the city. Well, the power structure said, no, we don't want that. So what did they do? They passed in uh, 1911 the first anti-black segregation ordinance in the United States. And there was this flurry, flurry of, of congratulations of Baltimore by other cities and saying, ah, we're going to do that too. And so you ended up with an ordinance that said white people and black people can't live on the same block. That was the sort of guts of that ordinance. What happens next? Let's take this through the 20s and 30s. That starts now, this cycle of the adaptive cycle starts with block, this blockwise segregation ordinance. The disturbance to that was the invalidation of, this, of ordinances like this by the Supreme Court in 1917. And I'm happy to say, that the suit that, that allowed that um, decision was brought by the Louisville NAACP, which some of my ancestors had helped um, form and operate. Now, before you start thinking, oh, isn't the Supreme Court in 1917 this progressive thing? Uh, no. They said, we're invalidating this ordinance or this kind of ordinance because it denies to property owners the right to sell to whomever they want. Not very progressive at all. By the way, um, you know, I'm mostly talking about racialization relative to black in, in this talk, but the first anti-racialized um, anti group law, segregation law in the United States was the residential um, ordinance in San Francisco that forbade Chinese folks from living outside of, of restricted districts. It's not just tourism, people. Um, so when this ordinance was, was invalidated, the power structure in Baltimore said, nope, we still don't want that. So what did they do? They established deed covenants that said, you cannot sell this property to, to uh, a black person. You cannot sell this property to a, uh, a Jewish person. You cannot sell this, per this property. They had a few, few other categories. There was a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment built into this process as well. And neighborhood improvement associations were mobilized in neighborhoods that felt racially threatened to have the, the city respond to their needs. This then leads to a coarser scale segregation, neighborhood or district-wide segregation. And in the 30s then, you see this codified in redlining. This is the Baltimore red line map, mortgage-worthy, worthiness map that was done in, I believe, 1934. 239 cities in the United States were classified by mortgage worthiness. Where should a bank lend money? Where should a bank not lend money for, well, for any purpose? And these things incorporated, it's, it's a federal program, the Home, Home Owners Loan Corporation was a federal program, but when they went into a city to do the classification, they based it on 
local knowledge. The local real estate agencies were, were brought in, the local banks were brought in. So this was not a top-down only process but of the federal government coming in and being the evil actor. There were actors local as well. So this thing, um, ha this has inhibited local wealth accumulation. I, I'm gonna tell you a story. I was, um, for the panel that I talked in on Thursday night at our institute that talked about ecology of segregation, I looked up the red line, well, I had looked at the redlining map of, of Louisville, and, you know, I grew up in Louisville, I didn't know about redlining, but when I looked at this map, I said, oh, look, here in this red zone is where I grew up, and then in, when urban renewal happened, which, of course, was, was, was essentially a map of the red line <laughs> for um, redevelopment, so to speak, well, we tried to move to um, an area that had gotten, had been classified as A, A grade, good mortgage risk. And the red line areas that we lived in were in the floodplain, the floodplain of the Ohio. And the A areas, most of them were in the highlands, literally the high ground in Louisville, outside the floodplain. So we tried to, my father tried to buy a house in that area. You know, they give you some money, even in urban rural, they give you some money. And, um, and the real estate agent didn't realize that he was uh, dealing with a, a, a black man. And when the real estate agent learned that he was about to do business with a black family, he said, mm. Actually, what he said was, if I had sold you a house, I would have lost my license. So this is part of the system. This is part of the system. So we ended up moving down to one of the uh, B-graded air areas farther west, a little bit past the, the red line area in Louisville. And um, I looked up the Zillow estimates for those neighborhoods. Actually, I looked up the Zillow estimate for the house that my family had lived in for several decades. I don't know what we got when we sold it. And I looked at um, a house in, or a couple of houses, several houses in the neighborhood where we had tried to buy. The, the very house that we had lived in, where we moved after um, urban renewal was valued by Zillow, who knows what the magic they used to get that, was valued at $130,000. And in the neighborhood that we had wished to move to, houses of roughly the same sort of size and number of bedrooms and that kind of thing were going uh, 430, 450 and up. So there's a lot of data in the aggregate that, that demonstrates that, that uh, redlining has been associated with, with impaired wealth accumulation by people who owned properties in those red line neighborhoods. And I'm just now showing you that those, those uh, data also have personal histories. <laughs> I'm not bitter, I'm not saying that. I'm just giving you a sense that this is real stuff. <laughs> this is a description of this particular yellow classified, sort of this is, this is next to red, in Baltimore. And the University of Richmond has accumulated a lot of these data, and you can click on each, these things in various cities, not all the cities, and you get the summary that they actually wrote for the, what was it called, the security grading. Security grading, sounds harmless, doesn't it? Sounds just like data. And so they describe where it is, and here's and this, this an old residential section seriously threatened with Negro encroachments. A small section along Reister's and well, da, 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 um, converted apartments, population increase, it's increasing. So detrimental, detrimental figure, features, detrimental features, obsolescence and Negro encroachment. I mean, in a lot of ways, we're lucky that they said this stuff out loud because now you don't say it out loud. So I've shown you how this, this racialized ranking that supports segregation is a resilient system. It's a resilient system. Now resilience these days is often spoken of as a good thing. Resilience is just a mechanism. What is resilient can be either good or bad, 
okay? That's one reason why I separate sustainability as a normative realm from resilience as a mechanistic realm. That's just me. This is Baltimore today. Same patterns, scaled up. So it's not just the city anymore. It's the city, the surrounding counties. It's the same thing, just bigger, with different federal subsidies than in the 1880s. There are some correlates of segregated patterns. I'm going to show you uh, four, I think, here. This is the toxic release inventory sites in Baltimore. This is the city here. The darker purple is pr proportion black, and the other colors are, are, are less African American. And each little dot here is one of the uh, to EPA's toxic release inventory sites with a couple of buffers around it. And what you see here is what's surprising to us, that the toxic release inventory sites are associated with white populations in Baltimore. That's not usually how the pattern works. It's usually, they're usually associated with people of color, with populations of color. But it's still segregation. Why do I say that? Because the, the white folks were allowed to live closer to the factories. That was a benefit. They were closer to work. Black people had to leave, live farther away. So now it flips around and the associations with the toxic release inventory sites are unexpected, but it's still um, a, pa a process of segregation. This shows canopy, tree canopy and lifestyle groups. The height of the bar is a census group, is the canopy cover, the amount of tree cover, the proportion of tree cover in uh, a census block group. And the thing that you see here is that these categories up here, these are kind of silly names, but it's based on um, market analysis. That's the kind of thing that if you have a business and you want to set up a new shop, a new store, or whatever, you can buy from this company indicators of lifestyle, and you can sort of decide on that basis, sort of disaggregating the, the, the data behind these silly names, where you want to put your your, your Trader Joe's or your Target or whatever it is. And these lifestyle categories are another way to say that we have social status that is associated with ecological patterns in the city. This shows redlining. It's a little, it's a little hard for me to, I, you, I'm just showing you this more or less as a cartoon. I'm not going to walk you through this. This was a paper that Dexter Locke and some of us in Baltimore did in 1921 in NPJ, Nature uh, uh, Urban Sustainability. And what you see, we looked at uh, um, 37 cities in the United States and, and looked at the redlining um, data, the redlining map, and the current tree canopy. And what, what we discovered is that in all these cities, except for very, very few, that the redlining pattern is a good statistical predictor of where you have trees now. Segregation is also related to land vacancy, vacant buildings, vacant lots. And there's a lag between, there's a lag here. It's not just, a, it, the part of the story is that there's no maintenance. I'm, I would say deferred maintenance, but it's not even deferred maintenance. I mean, it's a lack of maintenance. It's absentee landlords. It's, um, it's exploitative uh, ownership for renting. It's extraction of wealth yet again from underprivileged places. And it takes a while for this to turn into vacant buildings and vacant lots. But it has its roots in the processes that, that well, I won't go back, that, that generated the segregation pattern in general. What does ecology have to do with race? So I, this is what race had to do with ecology I just showed you. It's a template for inequality. And a lot of people refer to this as environmental racism. Now, racism. Now, one of the things about it is that you take the environment as given and you ask about how that relates to equity or in injustice. And it's an important area for activism. It's an important area for scholarship. My message as an ecologist 
is what's the, what's the other part of the loop look like? Let's not think about the environment as given. Let's think about the environment as a socially and biophysically created thing, which in and of itself, with those components, is capable of change. Segregation and ecology are both about spatial heterogeneity. Both about spatial heterogeneity. Uh, there's some other things ecology does, but a lot of it rests on spatial heterogeneity. You think about a lot of evolution and population differentiation, for example. Now, if you take segregation to be a systemic, institutional, and individual actions that isolate racialized or ethnic groups, that's what we mean by segregation. How does that relate to ecology? How does it relate to the structure and function of the biophysical opponents, uh, components of our, our urban systems? So we think about this as potentially a loop that really needs to be unpacked. There, what are the ecological heterogeneities that have been used to support differential apportionment of resources? In, in, well, in all kinds of settlements, not just cities, but you think about rural um, apportionment of resources, especially rel relative to indigenous folks. If you think about segregation, how can it, how does it re res result in environmental structures and, fu and, and functions and dynamics and fluxes based on these racialized categories or associated with these racialized categories? <clears throat> One of the big mistakes would be for ecology to take race as a cause, right? It's not. I'm emphasizing here that we're looking at the correlates, the racialized system that generates the environmental bads and helps guide environmental benefits to higher status to groups that are given higher status in the social system. So if racism is a created social system, then maybe we can counter it with a contrasting system. So can ecology be anti-racist? Adam Serber, in a, a few weeks ago, uh, commenting on Whoopi Goldberg sort of stepping in the uh, bi big misunderstanding of, of um, Jewishness and, and discrimination, <clears throat> I had a really interest, a really s nice piece of writing. It is not necessary for race to be real, for racism to be real. It is only necessary that people believe race to be real. When people act on fictions, these, those actions have repercussions, even if the underlying belief is false. Can ecology be anti-racist? I took my cue from a, a paper by two folks in, um, public health who said public health needs to be anti-racist. So I said, well, let me look at this. And there was a, a bunch of people that, who wrote about can ecology be anti-racist in the, the Nature of Cities blog, TNOC, um, and it's beyond equity, what does an anti-racist urban ecology look like? I point you to that because there were a lot of really cool perspectives brought to bear in that. Following the public health experts, here is what ecology might consider. First of all, to adopt race consciousness, to be aware that racialization is a social phenomena that is ubiquitous in the United States. And I've showed class, and sometimes race is also a, a big driver. Racialization is a big driver elsewhere. Understanding that racism evolves. I've shown you the adaptive cycle. The machinery of racism changed over that time. Who's benefiting and who's in charge stayed exactly the same, but racism as a machine evolved. One of the recommendations is to do your work, center your work in places that are inhabited by marginalized people, whether it's racialization or indigeneity, or, or, or migrant groups or, or, or whatnot, because these places have been understudied by ecologists. That means that we have less sort of on the ground experience to share with the residents in those areas. We have less understanding ourselves of those areas so that when it comes to sharing knowledge that might be useful to them, we have less experience. 
And then the other thing, the final thing they say is be attentive to equity in praxis. Now, praxis is this, this crazy Greek word that kind of says you're concerned with theory or concept and practice together. You don't try to separate them. You realize they're tied together. But to, to always to say when you're involved in an intervention or a plan or something that you hope improves the situation, that you say, is this going to improve equity for, for people? Or is this going to reinforce the status quo? Is it going to change conditions in ways that might threaten people's sense of well-being or their capacity to, to remain in those, the places that they desire? So that's what it means to be attentive to, to equity in praxis. And I probably should, uh, what I'm just going to do is go through those and indicate that there are some, some subsets of those. But what, this one's important because we really need to better understand the role of structural racism in science. John mentioned the, the um, natural history collections, the, um, the role that that played in, in finding capital to exploit in other places, wealth to exploit outside of the capitals of Europe. And I just, I'm embarrassed to say that I read a, a, a paper that was published in Science a couple of years ago that pointed to the fact that a lot of the, the work done to collect specimens around the world was actually done on the infrastructure of, 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 of slavery. It was done on the transportation infrastructure, the, the the social networks of infrastructure and sometimes the uncompensated work associated with, with, with slavery. Now, being race conscious is not the same as being racist. And, and it's because you mention race or, or racism doesn't tar you with that brush. It's not the same and, and a lot of our discourse is really being quite, um, quite blind to that. Another thing is it's not, being race conscious means that color blindness just says there's no problem, there's no issue. So color blindness is, a, is not a useful thing. So the big message for ecologists is that racialized identity is a factor in social ecological systems. Period. All right, it evolves. We don't go into the details here. I've mentioned some of that thing, those things before. All right, so if systematic racism created segregated environments, then created environments can be changed. How do we do that? How do we as a discipline contribute to that? We at the, the Cary Institute, you know, the, the definitions of ecology are kind of strange when you go back through the history. Ecology is the study of the distribution and abundance of animals. Well, that offended me as a plant ecologist. Um, isn't there more than distribution and abundance? Well, yeah, maybe distribution and abundance is kind of the, the surface pattern that you have to unpack. Or Odom the Odom brothers said that uh, ecology is the study of ecosystem processes. Well then, but you, you can't leave, how, why are you leaving out species, for example? So a lot of the definitions of ecology are sort of weirdly narrow. And so at Cary Institute, we a few years ago came up with one that's not perfect, but it's broader, scientific study of the processes influencing the distribution and abundance of organisms the interactions among organisms and the interactions between organisms and the transformation and flux of energy and matter. And I've, I've been working with a, an architect for a number of years and it's one of the things that's useful in working with people who are really different in expertise is that they'll call you out on things. And, and Brian and I were talking recently and he said, who controls the interactions and transformations? And my answer was, bleh, bleh, bleh. but um, you know, the point is that if these interactions and transformations impinge on humans, human-influenced environments or human 
generated infrastructures, somebody's in control of them. Who? And how do you bring that praxis of equity to that? All right, I'm, you know, think about this. You get into it, and I have no idea how far I am into this. So, assuming that I'm very far into it. I'm going to show you one final story. And Lawrence Brown, thank you. All right. I can, I can do this. Lawrence Brown, who was a professor um, at Morgan State University at, in Baltimore for a while, <clears throat> wrote an, uh, an editorial in the Baltimore Sun yesterday, which, as, as we might say informally, opened a new window into the mind of the Baltimore Sun. You can translate that into whatever vernacular you like. And what he said was the Baltimore Sun, the white-owned, and what he said, going through the history of the Baltimore Sun, um, was a newspaper that supported white supremacy, that supported slavery, that supported oppression and displacement of, of black folks. And he had, there's apparently a website where you can go and you can look for phrases in, in newspapers. And he um, extracted phrases that had to do with selling black folks into slavery, uh, capturing escaped slaves, and uh, renting out the labor of enslaved folks. So um, one final story, Seneca Village in New York City. You know, I'm, I'm a, um, you, you have to love how some of our cities have dealt with green spaces. I mean, Central Park, and actually the, the park estate of New York City is quite remarkable. There are thousands of acres of green space. They're not all in well accessible places. Central Park, this was the survey for Central Park in 1856. Central Park was built in 1858, at which time it was the largest public works project in the United States ever. All right. Here's uh, 8th Avenue up here at the top, so this is uh, west. Here's 5th Avenue, so this is east down here, north that way. I have no idea why they did this map like this, because the numbers are done as though you were reading it upside down and backwards. But um, they, there were some reservoirs in New, New York City. has been taking water from upstate for you know, a long time. And there was a, a village here, Seneca Village, which apparently didn't have anything to do with Indian tribes. It had to do, apparently, with honoring ancient philosophers. And when I read the history of, of Central Park a number of years ago, I remember hearing, reading that Central Park, there was, there were, there was a squatter's village that was replaced to build Central Park. You know, just a bunch of shacks. Seneca Village was an outpost of a black community. They had schools, churches, they owned their homes, they had infrastructure, they had community. These were two of the people who, this was a recent, recent nice uh, piece in the New York Times, two of the property owners there. They don't look like squatters to me. And so this was obliterated and wiped off the map. And that, that's one thing, you know, to say, there was, a, there was a, a settlement of black people here that was successful settlement, and we had to take that out to make the park. No, they changed the narrative. They said it was a bunch of losers living in shacks, a place of no consequence. OK. Segregation is a global phenomenon. It's driven by socially constructed racism and classism, and colorism too. Social drivers behind race and class shape environment. Race doesn't cause anything. 
To improve cities, we have to identify the environmental outcomes of racist and classist systems and engage in knowledge co-production to compensate. And I am done. Thank you very much. Questions now let me remind you if you have questions here in the audience, wait for the where's the runner? I have the cube. Oh, good. <laughs> wait for the runner. Yeah. So first question. Well while you're Yeah. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to how you use these historical cases as a way to think through um, the role of racism and the ways in which we can change structures for our present day work. Yes. Can you describe, oh, I have to move it closer, okay. Can you describe how you use historical cases as a way to look at present day ecological cases? We, in uh, most of our empirical work that I refer to is work in, and there are several components. Contemporary vacant buildings, where vacant and since it's racial, some of our folks went through the legal uh, records for zoning variances and found out that there were four Baltimore Historical the myth Check, check, check. So I'll just hold it up here which will remind us all to eat the mic. Um, so where was I? So we, we've actually done historical analyses. And there's some in, interviews with, with older folks and, and, and that sort of thing. Thank you, Stuart. Um, yeah, I, you, you mentioned uh, the issue of equity and that we should be looking uh, through a, an equity lens. But sometimes, and most of the times, actually, a lot of these inequalities have been accumulating through history. And, and equity might not be enough, you know. And, and so I'm just wondering, uh, what have you thought about what could be something that we can do as ecologists to go beyond the equity issue, and whether you have given any thought about reparations and how, how, what shape will that take in, in an ecological uh, framework? It is easier for me actually to think about the, the compensatory actions relative to equity being mostly in the social realm. It, where we as ecologists probably need to be sensitive is to not assume that everything is green is going to be good for everybody. 
I think that's the kind of quick and easy thing to say ecologically. But uh, as far as as really deeply correcting the, 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 the problems of equity, that's a big social conversation that we hardly seem to be able to have in this, in this country. There are deep histories that have to be overcome. It's, you know, I'm not asking for a check. It'd be nice to think about how to make um, quality education broadly available. It would be really useful to think about how do you make effective health care that understands people's communities and constraints broadly available. That's way beyond ecology. Thinking about ecological processes, you know, in ecology, we're always concerned about how flow rate materials, but also can move from place to place. So we have a, a gradient here where we have uh, farming areas in the summer all the way into Detroit where we have urban gardening moving. What, what, what are your thoughts about incorporating those kinds of ecological processes? I think it's great, and and Detroit is well known for its its urban farming estates and the vigor of it and the of it. So I think that as as ecologists, being a a part of understanding that better and helping people to understand what the ecological implications are. John, they're trying to get your attention. Um, that's really, really important. And I think that there's one of the things I worry about a little bit is urban designers coming into places and saying, oh, this is a great place for a farm. Well, how do you know that? And who's going to farm it? And what do they, what, how, how, what, how do they want their lives to unfold? So um, yeah, it's an, important, it's an important thing. And Detroit has uh, a lot of uh, good e examples that many other people are So watching. do you think NSF should give us an LTER for a, our Detroit project? Uh, you know, don't, don't talk to me about NSF. Um, <laughs> You know, NSF, yeah. <laughs> I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. And I think urban agriculture would be a really nice core integrative process. Uh, Catherine? Um, you mentioned in your, I don't know if this is, you mentioned in your talk the, uh, several times that there are things that aren't going very well in the United States. So I, I know because you've traveled and, and worked in other places, are there other societies where you see a more successful reckoning with these, this history? And in part, I'm motivated by a constant question in my mind, which is, do we need a truth and reconciliation process here? One of the things that I do admire about South Africa, with all its difficulties, is that it has attempted to, to go through that process. It was less than perfect. And, and I think that it would be really useful to have a substantial conversation in this country about race. And, you know, we, we are, one of the reasons that I think it's useful to think about institutionalized racism or, or racism as a system is it's a way to hopefully have people not think that fingers are being pointed at, at individuals. And I think, you know, one of the things that when I was a kid, you know, what did I learn about 
you know, it, race was racism and race, racial disadvantage were sort of cast in terms of individual bad behaviors. And as I've become a, an expert in social ecological systems, thank you, my social and historical colleagues, I've learned that it's not, that's the least of it. Nobody wants to be assaulted, either physically or verbally, with racial categories. But the real problem is, is something other than, than that. And, and until we come to understand that, like uh, Lawrence Brown said in the, the quote that I took, you know, incomplete stories will lead to incomplete solutions. Okay, I think we're, we have to cut it off right now. We have to move to our other speakers. Thanks so much, Stuart. Let's give Stuart another round of applause.